and take the scriptures and turn with me to the 20th chapter of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. Tonight, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at the second of the commandments. The second of the commandments. I don't know how, um, I, I don't know how consistently the righteousness of God as set forth in the commandments is preached in American churches today. I come to church here and that's about all I know other than what I may hear from this place, that place or the other. But uh, I do remember that many years ago that I was preaching through on Sunday morning, I was preaching through the Ten Commandments. And there was a lady who was just um, seemed to be devastated by it. At the end of the service, I came in and she was, she says, why do you have to be so negative? And uh, I tried to talk with her. I said, well, there are very positive things in the word of God, but there are negative things in the word of God as well. And uh, 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 it, it was obvious that she was hearing things perhaps that she, for whatever reason, had not heard before and, and recognizing that there is a, a standard of righteousness there in uh, the law of God. The Lord Jesus Christ said he didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it, and that's what he did by his perfect obedience, by his death, ultimately on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. But, but we do need to recognize that the moral law has not been set aside. The, the, the civil law has, the ceremonial law has. We don't, we, I don't, did anybody bring a sharp knife and a lamb with you to church? I don't think you did. Uh, that's a thing of the past. At least I hope you didn't, but, but uh, you understand that the moral law is still there. And of course, the specific commandments and then summarized in love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors yourself, and summarized uh, Paul says you can summarize the whole thing in thou shalt love your neighbors yourself. And of course, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. All of this is law. It's not the gospel. And we want to make that distinction again. The proclamation of the law of God is good for sinners. It's good for lost people because it shows them their sin. It shows them in what areas they have fallen short. And the Holy Spirit takes that and uses it to point people to Christ and say, you are unrighteous, but Christ is righteous. And so put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a civil use, I think, at least in terms of equity, there is a, a civil use of the law that should be anyway among the nations. And then there is that guidance aspect of the law for Christians that we don't, we don't reject it. We don't say, well, uh, I can just do anything I want to. I can be as licentious as I want to. We still understand that if we commit murder, it's murder. We still understand that if we covet, it's coveting. It's still sin. We understand these things. And so it's good for us to think from time to time about these things. And then especially in the light of who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what the Lord Jesus Christ has come to do. Because that takes us to... The gospel, which is not about what we do, but about what the Lord has done for us. So thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, Jehovah thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That's the way I learned it a long, long time ago from the 1611 translation, the, uh, the so called sometimes the authorized version of the King James. Uh, let's read it now again from the ESV in I'll just start with verse 1 again. It's a very short passage here. And God spoke all these words saying, 
I am the Lord, or I am Jehovah your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. We talked about that last week. Then the second is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, that would be something flying along, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So what is the law again? Well, the first table of the law is our duty to God, the first four commandments. That's the first table of the law. The last six, our duty to our fellow human beings. What is the gospel? The gospel is not the law. It's different. The law shows us our sinfulness. The gospel shows us Christ. The gospel shows us the one who has the righteousness that we need. So let's look at the first prohibition again tonight. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, this did not prohibit all sculpture. Let's turn over just a page or two in your Bible to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 17. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 17. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. I was telling my family this afternoon, visiting with them, that when I was a seminary student, when I was working on a master's degree, uh, I was taking a preaching course, and the the preaching professor was Dr. Wilbur Swartz. Uh, You could probably still see him from time to time in some old movies. He had a lot of bit parts in movies, and you see him with uh, Mickey Rooney and all that. You know, he just he was a really good actor. But he was a preaching professor at New Orleans Seminary, and uh, and so. uh, he said something very kind to me on that occasion. He said, Joe, can, after I preached, you know, we, had, we had to preach ourselves in preaching class. He said, Joe, can think on his feet. Well, I didn't figure out how to do that myself, though that's something that I guess the Lord just gives you. But, but he said, Joe, can think on his feet. He said, now, he said, do any of you have any criticisms or comments or questions? And one fellow raised his hand and he said, yes, sir. He said, what? He said, well, Joe uses he uses a lot of long words that people don't understand. And he said, exactly what long word was it that he used? And he said, mercy seat. And, you know, and I, and I thought, poor fellow, you know, he obviously, uh, the Lord had called him, I hope, to preach, but, but he didn't have a lot of knowledge of Scripture. But this term, mercy seat, goes all the way back in our English usage to at least uh, the King James, probably back to the Geneva and so on, you know, back before that, those translations. What was the mercy seat? The mercy seat was the lid of what? The Ark of the Covenant, you see, where the blood was applied. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth, and you shall make two cherubim of gold. Cherubim, what's a cherubim? Cherubim is an angelic representation, a representation of an angelic being. You shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work shall you make them, on the two ends of the mercy seat. You've seen pictures of it. You know, the, the lid is there, and then you have the cherub, the cherubim 
overshadowing this way the cherubim, overshadowing this way with the, the wings. So make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end of one piece with a mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be, and you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I'll give you. There I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Now, so we have these, these are sculptures, aren't they? You see, uh, representing these, these, uh, these figures that are there. So obviously the commandment did not mean that sculpture was just out period. It didn't mean that. I think there have been people in uh, iconoclastic people in time said, did, I can use a big word if I want to, iconoclastic people in, in, uh, in past times, you know, that just want to break everything up, tear everything down. But, but uh, so sculpture was not prohibited, but it certainly did prohibit false gods as in Romans chapter 1. Remember what Paul says there in Romans chapter 1. He says in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So he says there's this creation out there. And when you look at that creation, you see the handprint, as it were, of the creator. You see represented there a testimony to the existence of God, of the creator, so they are without excuse for although they knew God they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened claiming to be wise they became fools now when they became fools what did they do this is the question claiming to be wise they became fools now so there's a creator and then there's this creation which is a testimony to him Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Well, guess what they did? And exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the God who's, who cannot die, for images resembling mortal man. All these things are part of the creation itself. Not the creator, but the creation. Exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man. Sometimes they look like a human being and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, and so on. So, so he says, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. So they are creating these things with every intent of bowing down and worshiping them. They are taking things that the creator has made and transforming them, so to speak, into gods that they are now going to bow down and worship. So the first prohibition, obviously, you shall not make for yourself a graven image or a carved image, didn't prohibit all sculpture. You have the cherubim, but it certainly prohibits making uh, an image uh, and creating a God in that way. It also prohibits representing God in a false way. And I think this lies at the very heart of the matter. Look at Exodus chapter 32. Turn over there just a few pages ahead in your Bible to the 32nd chapter of Exodus. And look at verse 1 and following. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron 
Now, who's Aaron? Aaron's Moses' brother, right? So he's down, he's left down there with the people. They gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up! They're, they're being very uh, forceful. Get up, Aaron, do this. Up, make us gods who shall go before us. They had just come out of Egypt. They didn't have just one god down there. What they have? They had lots of them. So make us some gods. Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. <laughs> Don't make a graven image. He's got a graving tool here. He fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, the word God, this translated God here is the generic word for God. You know, probably know what it is, Elohim. Elohim is the Hebrew word. It can be plural. It can be singular. All the translations I have ever seen translate this. These are your gods, O Israel. I think the reason they do that is because they said, up, Aaron, right? Get up, Aaron and make us some Elohim gods, you see. And they translate that as plural, which is probably correct because they came out of that, that polytheistic background. So, uh, so these are your gods. But I have difficulty with the expression, these are your gods, O Israel, when they're pointing at how many golden calves? Just one. All right, so I think... It's singular here, you know. This is your God. You want to know what the God who brought you out of Egypt, who manifested his power, who parted the sea? You want the God who visited plagues on the Egyptians? You want to know what he's like, what he's really like? Why he looks like this golden calf here. That can, it's an adequate representation of him. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So it, it seems very clear to me that it prohib prohibits, the commandment prohibits representing God in a false way and, uh, and pointing to something and saying this adequately represents, shows you what God is like, shows you what teaches you what God is is like. What about some contemporary breaches of this commandment that many see no harm in? I get real nervous when I see things like stained glass windows or icons representing the father as an old man, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I, 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 that, I, I don't care for that. Are the son particularly represented as a carved image on a crucifix? which becomes an object of worship or adoration. Um, you know, uh, those who, who uh, ha have those, um, there's a tradition there of changing the Ten Commandments. Are you aware of that? Have you ever noticed that? Um, I was down at a certain hospital in Baton Rouge visiting somebody one day, and I came down the escalator, and lo and behold, there was a a framed uh, plaque, or whatever you want to call it, of the Ten Commandments there. And I looked at it, and I said, hmm, that's accurate. That's the Ten Commandments, as in Exodus chapter 20. The next time I went into that hospital and I came down the escalator, that plaque had been removed. Why? Because they take... They, they turn the last commandment into two commandments and they delete this commandment, you see, about not making a 
carved image, a graven image. That's in their catechetical instruction down through the, oh, I don't know how many years that's been going on, but a long, long time. So we need to understand these things that, that uh, I'll grant you that I can understand a piece of sculpture that a person might not necessarily bow down before it and, and, and worship and adore, but I, I, was, I spent time in Russia uh, a number of years ago teaching pastors, and I was in Moscow at that very famous Russian Orthodox Church, St. Basil's in Red Square. You know, where right outside you have the block where you chop people's heads off, and you go into St. Basil's, and Lenin is lying in his tomb over here. You go into St. Basil's, and I stood there for a good long while. There's, most of those Russian Orthodox churches are kind of dark and dank. And, and I stood there for a, a long while and watched people come in. And they had put plexiglass over these icons. They don't so much have the carved images. Of the, they have these paintings, you know. And they put plexiglass over the paintings, the icons. And women would come in and they would kiss. The reason the plexiglass was there is because they were running them you know, kissing away the, the paint of the, but that's adoration, that's worship. And, and this is something that this commandment, I think, clearly warns people against. Well, what's the second prohibition here? Well, look at verse, uh, uh, verse five again, uh, and uh, the very first part of it. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, uh, your God, am a jealous God. So don't bow down to them or serve them. To use an image as an aid in worship or especially to use an image as an object of worship would clearly be a breach of this uh, second aspect of the commandment. So don't, don't bow down to them or serve them. And then there's an attached word what does this attached word tell us about how important this commandment is to the Lord? You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, and again, it's Lord Yahweh, Jehovah, I, Jehovah, your God, am a jealous God. Now, jealous sounds like something bad to us, but there, there's in this older sense of the word jealous or jealousy, it means that he loves his own. He cares for his own. He is jealous for his own. So for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. It's a way of saying that there are these people that it goes on and on from generation to generation. They have nothing but hatred, nothing but loathing for me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me, thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So, so there's a great, a great uh, word of warning here about how seriously the Lord God takes these Things. And, and I think that we need to be very, very careful about uh, this business of, of, of idolatry, whether it be gross idolatry, or but and that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about a carved image, a graven image. I think I told you uh, a couple of services back maybe about a fellow I taught with years ago uh, when I was teaching college in a, uh, named Hak Sung Choi. He was a Korean and somebody came up with one of those little Buddhas, little fat Buddhas, you know, that somebody had given them. And he was proudly show this professor was proudly showing it around. And Hop looked at it. He's a Christian from North Korea. The communists had killed most of his family. He had eventually found his way to the United States. He was serious about Christ. And he saw the little Buddha. And he just, he, he just blurted out. He says, idol, idol, like that. And that really ought to be our reaction to uh, people bowing down before graven images in that way. Well, then, is there, though, we said that we don't want to misrepresent God, right? Uh, we don't want to point to a golden calf and say, that's what God is like. So is there an image of God that should be honored? 
that should be worshipped. Let's turn back to Colossians again. Colossians chapter 1, read from it just a few moments ago. Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to start this time with verse 15. He's talked about how the Lord has delivered us from the domain of darkness back in verse 13 and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in, in whom we have redemption. He's paid the price to uh, take our sins away, the forgiveness of sins. He provided pardon for sins for us. He is the image. What, Paul, did you say? What, what, what image? I thought we weren't supposed to honor images, Paul. You're a Pharisee of the Pharisee, Paul. What are you doing talking about images? See, you begin to see what's going on here? Do you see? He says, he is the image. He's talking about Christ. And he says, he is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what the invisible God is like? And he's not talking about a physical representation. God is spirit, and we worship him in, in spirit and truth, but he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven. Now, remember, back in Romans chapter 1, they thought they were wise, but they were foolish, and they started worshiping things from the created order. He says, now, here is someone from the created order, Christ, who has actually taken to himself the likeness of sinful human beings, although he was without sin, but he has become a human being, and he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. He's the creator God in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. This creation that we see was done for the one we know as the Lord Jesus Christ, for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He existed before anything else did, He's before all things. He sustains all things. In him, all things hold together. And he's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Now we're talking language that certainly is appropriate of God, aren't we? For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Parallel passage in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Paul says there that he lavished his grace on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. And how did he do this? By dying on the cross, by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary. He is the one that we can worship and should worship as the image of God. And so, what is it now? It's only, what this is uh, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, it's a few months yet, but Christmas is going to show up again, I think, one day, Lord willing. If the Lord does it, come back first. Christmas is going to show up again, right? And uh, we'll, Mark will say, uh, let's sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And we'll hear the words of Charles Wesley, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, you see. We're pointing people to Jesus Christ. The reason it was so wrong to look to a, to a, a golden image is because it could never begin to 
to represent God as he should be represented. But you can point to Jesus and say the one who died in the place of undeserving sinners on the cross, who was buried and has been raised in power. Oh, yes, he is worthy of our praise and our adoration. So I would ask you, have you truly repented of your sins and gone to Christ by faith so that your sins might be washed away? Have you trusted in Christ? Is he your savior? And, and if he is, I would say, is the Lord Jesus Christ the object of your greatest devotion or do you love someone or something more than him? We need to examine ourselves about this, don't we? We need to say, is Christ really the one that I, that I worship and adore? Uh, have you been willing to give up a life that's not worthy of Christ? In, in other words, is there really evidence that you love him in the way that you think? The way you use your tongue? And in the way that you live your life? We need to examine ourselves on this one because he is the image of the invisible God. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, again, we pray that you'll take these words and bless them to our minds and hearts and ultimately to the, our living of our lives and our service for you. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.